In this video, I want to talk about Roman Catholic bishops, and I want to prove to you from the Word of God that the office of the bishop in the Roman Catholic Church is not only unbiblical, it's actually contrary to the Word of God. Now, I do want to make it clear right at the beginning that the Bible does talk about bishops, but the office of the bishop in the New Testament is very different to the office of the bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. For one, in the Roman Catholic Church, you have one bishop that rules over a city or a diocese, and he has many churches and priests under him and deacons. But in the New Testament, every single city had a plurality of bishops. This is very, very important because if there's no such thing as the bishop of a particular city, then there's no such thing as the bishop of Rome. And if there's no such thing as the bishop of Rome, there's no such thing as the pope. And if there's no such thing as the pope, the whole Roman Catholic system falls apart. Now, I'm going to take you through the scriptures and I'm going to prove to you that every single city had a plurality of bishops. Then I want to answer some of the common objections that Roman Catholics would make against this video. And then I want to read to you a couple of quotes from one of the early church fathers, St. Clement of Rome, who supposedly was the third pope of Rome. And I want to prove to you that St. Clement of Rome taught the same thing that I'm going to teach you here in this video. A couple of other differences that we're going to look at as well is that um, bishops, generally speaking in the New Testament, had to be married and had to have children who were faithful. In addition to that, the bishops were actually voted in by the people, not by the Pope of Rome. So I'm going to take you through the scriptures to prove this to you, then deal with their objections, and then give you some quotes from St. Clement of Rome, who supposedly was the third Pope of Rome. Have a look at Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, and it says this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city, as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, notice that the Apostle Paul uses the term elders and bishop interchangeably to refer to the same office. For the Apostle Paul, an elder is a bishop. That's very clear. He starts off saying, you know, I've commanded you to appoint elders in every city. And then he begins to give the criteria of an elder. And then he says, for a bishop must be blameless. So for the Apostle Paul, an elder is a bishop. Notice also here that he clearly tells Titus to appoint elders, plural, in every city throughout the island of Crete. So according to the instructions of the Apostle Paul, uh, the uh, island of Crete is meant to have a plurality of bishops in every city across the entire island. Now, when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, they have one and one only across the entire island. They've just got one bishop. I mean, is that biblical? Is that correct? That seems to be contrary to what the Apostle Paul commanded Titus to set up. Now, should we listen to the Roman Catholic Church or should we listen to the Word of God? Let God be true and let every man be a liar. Notice as well that the Apostle Paul, as he begins to set out the criteria, he says that a man, if he wants to be a bishop, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. Now, when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, um, they forbid bishops from getting married. They forbid priests from getting married as well. And you have to be a priest in order to become a bishop. So it's a very strange thing here. We've got a clear uh, uh, command from the Apostle Paul uh, that a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. Now, I understand that um, some people say, well, there may be exceptions to that. You know, it, it may just be a, a general requirement, not necessarily a, a mandated requirement. OK, fair enough. I can accept that. But the point is this. You can't prohibit uh, somebody from having a wife and children if he wants to be a bishop. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is doing. But this is saying, look, this is one of the criteria. You know, it says in Timothy, you know, if a man doesn't know how to rule his own household, how can he rule the church of God, right? Well, the Catholic Church doesn't seem to have a problem with that. You know, something's amiss here. Something is, is wrong with the Roman Catholic Church. It's worth noting as well that in the epistle to Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy, 
Um, the Apostle Paul defines uh, the doctrine of you know, prohibiting people from getting married. He defines that as a doctrine of demons. Um, so that's something that we need to be careful of as well. But the main point that I want to make here is that the Apostle Paul sees the terms elders and bishop as referring to the same office. And he clearly instructed Titus to establish, uh, to appoint elders in every city across the island of Crete. Yet when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, um, they've got one bishop over the whole island. Is that biblical? No. There's a big difference between a bishop in the Bible and a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. When you look at the New Testament, we're going to see this, we're going to see some more. There's no such thing as one bishop over a region or over a city. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as the, the bishop of Rome or the bishop of Crete or the bishop of Ephesus or anything like that. All of this is completely unbiblical. Let me give you another one. This is uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. This is really straightforward. I'm just going to read this to you. It's going to just jump right off the page at you. It says this, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now, this passage could not be clearer. It's very clear that the Apostle Paul set up a plurality of bishops in the church of Philippi. It says, you know, the bishops and deacons. Now, notice as well here that um, he doesn't use the word elders here. He doesn't say, oh, greet the uh, bishops, elders, and deacons. He just says, greet the bishops and deacons. Why? Because bishops and elders are the same thing. Another passage that confirms uh, that perspective. Now, have a look with me at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, uh, beginning at verse 17. <clears throat> and here in this passage, the Apostle Paul, is uh, he stopped at Miletus uh, on his way to Jerusalem. And in Miletus, he calls for the elders of the church. Let me read to you verse 17. It says this, From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So here the Apostle Paul has stopped at Miletus and he's called for the elders from the church in Ephesus. Now, have a look at verse 28. Here he's speaking to the elders and he says this listen therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood now a couple of things i want to point out here you see that word overseers that's the same word for bishop in the greek that's the word Bishop. So here he's speaking to these elders and he said, you know, take uh, heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops. And then he says to shepherd. That's the word for pastor. Pastor the flock of God. So here we have the church of Ephesus. Uh, their elders are called to Miletus and we see that they're called bishops and pastors. So even the church of Ephesus had a plurality of of bishops, but guess how many bishops there are today in uh, Ephesus? Only one. Same with Philippi, only one, according to the Roman Catholic Church. Who should we follow? Should we follow the Catholic Church or should we follow the Word of God? Let God be true and let every man be a liar. Let me go, go to another passage. Acts chapter 14, beginning at verse 21, it says this. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Notice again here that the Apostle Paul, or Barnabas with him, appointed elders in every church. And we know that the word elder is used interchangeably with the word bishop. And so this is saying that there was a plurality of bishops in every church. Every time the Apostle Paul went around planting churches, he appointed elders in every single one of them. He appointed bishops in every single church one of them. So this idea of there being one bishop and one alone over this whole region is completely unbiblical. Now, I want to point out something else that's very interesting here. You see this word appointed, this word translated appointed. In the Greek, this word means uh, a show of hands. And basically, this is saying that the Apostle Paul appointed elders 
in every church by getting the congregation to vote them in. Let me read to you from the Greek dictionary. This is Thayer's definition. It says, one, to vote by stretching out the hand, two, to create or appoint by vote, one, to have charge of some office or duty, three, to elect, create, appoint. You see this reflected in the Didache actually, in chapter 15 it says this, therefore appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men meek and not lovers of money. 1 Timothy 3 verse 4, and truthful and proven. So according to the book of Acts and according to the Didache, one of the earliest church documents outside of the New Testament, bishops were voted in by the people, by the laity. That's what the Roman Catholics call ordinary people like you and like me. Uh, we are the laity, right? The bishops were voted in by the laity, right? Not by some pope in Rome. The bishops were voted in by the ordinary, everyday believers in a local area. Now, it's worth noting as well, as you go over to chapter 15, we were reading um, in chapter 14, but if you go over to cha um, chapter 15, verse 2, you see that the Apostle Paul, it says, went up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders. And remember the word elders here is bishops, which can be used interchangeably with bishops. So the Apostle Paul went up to Jerusalem to the apostles and bishops about the question of the Gentiles. And this is uh, what they call, you know, the first uh, Jerusalem council. But notice here that there is a plurality of elders, a plurality of bishops, even in Jerusalem. You've got the apostles and you've got these bishops. This totally destroys the Roman Catholic concept that there's just one bishop over a city or a diocese or whatever the case may be. Completely unbiblical, completely contrary to the church that the apostles established in the New Testament era. Now, Roman Catholics, they have a number of objections that they like to make against the idea of there being a plurality of bishops. Despite all of this evidence, which is very, very clear in my opinion, they argue that Timothy and Titus were like bishops that were above um, the local elders or the local bishops in a church. Now, this is to me unbiblical. First of all, we know that they had a plurality of bishops. It's very, very clear. The text says that. But secondly, you know, Timothy, he, he was an evangelist, right? And the Apostle Paul told him, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's what he said to the uh, to to Timothy, right? Now, Timothy, when when he was you know in Ephesus and he was told to appoint elders, the reason why he was exercising authority there was because there were no elders, there were no bishops in those churches. Same with Titus in Crete, there was no bishops in Crete. They were told to establish what was lacking and to appoint bishops in every city, in every church, right? And the idea was not that they would then be above the bishops. The idea would be that they would appoint bishops, set things in order, and then move on to the other places where the gospel was being spread and do the same thing there. So, you know, it's very clear that Titus and Timothy were evangelists that were working with the Apostle Paul to establish churches and to build up churches and to appoint elders and to give instructions and so forth so that these churches would be set in order and then they would move on. They didn't stay as bishops above all these other bishops in these particular areas. Another argument that the Roman Catholics try to use is they try to uh, point to Acts chapter one and they try to say in Acts chapter one, verse 20 and 21, that because Judas was replaced with another apostle, they try to say, well, that means that when all the other apostles die, they have to have a replacement voted in as well. And of course, they, you know, see this as getting bigger and bigger until you've got, you know, thousands of bishops across the world, right? A couple of things that are worth noting. I mean, let me just, first of all, just read the verse that they use so that you can see the context of their argument. It says this, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, Roman Catholics will honestly take this verse and they'll try to argue that since Judas had a successor when he died, that means that all of the other apostles have to have successors when they die as well. And they call this apostolic succession. And they claim that they are the successors of 
the apostles. There's a number of problems with this interpretation though. First of all, this has got nothing to do with a successor to Judas. This is talking about a replacement for Judas. There's a big difference between a replacement and a successor. A successor implies continuation. A replacement implies that you're just being replaced. Uh, Judas was an apostle. He uh, fell from his office of an apostle and he's replaced with someone else to take his office. Secondly, notice as well that the people again voted in Matthias. So the, this is the, the believers there in Jerusalem waiting in the upper room. They voted in Matthias to replace Judas, not as a successor, but as a replacement. So again, this is contrary to the way that the Roman Catholic Church does things. Notice also that this is the fulfillment of a prophecy. They were doing this in fulfillment of prophecy. Judas was to be replaced and he was replaced not with a bishop, but with an apostle. And if anybody wants to say that they are a replacement for one of the apostles, then they would have to claim that they themselves are an apostle. And I don't think that people are willing to do that. I'm certainly, I don't think Roman Catholics claim that. But if they did, the Bible is very clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, that the signs of an apostle is signs, wonders, and miracles done in all patience and perseverance. It says this, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So if somebody wants to claim to be a successor to one of the apostles, then I would like to see his signs, wonders, and miracles to prove it. Unless you're going to show me these signs, wonders, and miracles, I'm not going to believe that you are a successor to an apostle. Now, Roman Catholics will make another argument. They'll try to argue that if you look at church history, God, the Holy Spirit, guided the early church very quickly to go from having a plurality of bishops to having just one bishop over a city or diocese. And they try to say, well, if you look at the writings of um, St. Ignatius, it's very clear. He said, where the bishop is, there the people will be. And therefore, we must have only one bishop over a particular city or diocese or whatever the case may be. Now, th this argument is pretty weak for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, just looking at the writings of, of St. Ignatius, yes, he did say that, but he also said, I am not like Peter and Paul that I can issue you commands. So that's the first thing that I want to point out. He clearly did not consider his writings to be as authoritative as the word of God. Secondly, when you read um, St. Clement of Rome, who is supposedly the second, uh, sorry, the third bishop of Rome, he very clearly believed in a plurality of bishops in a local church. Uh, in his letter to the Corinthians, and this is um, from um, book one of set one of the church fathers, uh, page 16, uh, but his epistle to the Corinthians was being written to, and by the way, very early in this epistle uh, to the Corinthians, he uh, affirms uh, salvation by faith alone, apart from works. But he's writing to the Corinthians because the Corinthians had ejected a number of bishops from their office in Corinth. And he's writing to them and he's telling them, look, you need to accept these bishops back because they have been, you know, correctly, he says, voted in uh, by the people. That's very important to understand. And they haven't, you know, done anything wrong. You need to accept them back as bishops, as episcopates over your church. And he says this very clearly. I'm going to read to you a couple of quotes. Uh, the first one is on page 16. The second one will be on page 17. He says this. Let me read this to you. The apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has done so from God. Christ, therefore, was sent forth by God and the apostles by Christ. Both these appointments, then, were made in an orderly way, according to the will of God. Having, therefore, received their orders and being fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and established in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand and thus preaching through the countries and cities they appointed the first fruits of their labors, having first proven them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons of those who should afterwards believe. Nor was this any new thing, since indeed many ages before it was written concerning bishops and deacons, for thus saith the Scriptures in a certain place, I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons 
in faith. Notice here that Clement doesn't say elders and deacons, he says bishops and deacons. Why? Because he sees bishops the same way the Apostle Paul did. He sees bishops and elders being the same office. So clearly when we, and he's referring to the book of Acts, where they went around appointing bishops, elders, in every city. He's referring to that very clearly here, affirming that this was the practice of the apostles. Now on chapter, sorry, page 17, it says this, our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. That's the word for bishop. For this reason, they therefore, in as much as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned and afterwards gave instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. We are of the opinion, therefore, that those appointed by them or afterwards by eminent men with the consent of the whole church and who have blamelessly served the flock of Christ in a humble, peaceable and disinterested spirit and have for a long time possessed the good opinion of all, cannot be justly dismissed from the ministry. For our sin will not be small if we eject from the episcopate those who have blamelessly and holily fulfilled its duties. Blessed are those presbyters who, having finished their course before now, have obtained a fruitful and perfect departure from this world. For they have no fear lest anyone deprive them of the place now appointed them. But we see that ye have removed some men of the excellent behavior from the ministry which they fulfilled blamelessly and with honor. Notice there right at the end that he tells the Corinthian church that they have removed people from their ministry. What ministry? He mentions here in context the episcopate. So clearly, which is the word for, for bishop. So clearly, according to St. Clement of Rome, who is supposedly the third bishop of Rome, the early church had a plurality of elders, a plurality of bishops in every city. Very, very, very clear evidence. Now, scholars um, do point out that there was a change. They, they did move away from what God had set up through the apostles. Notice as well in there that they had received the approval. These uh, uh, um, bishops had received the ap approval of, of the entire church. And notice as well that it says, uh, according to uh, Clement of Rome, that the apostles had a perfect foreknowledge. Right? So this idea that, you know, uh, God somehow directed the church contrary to this, you know, after the death of the apostles just isn't really correct. It's, it's not only unbiblical, but it's also contrary to what uh, St. Clement said, who is supposedly the third pope of Rome. You're going against the Pope. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's just absolutely ridiculous. I, I think there was a change and I wouldn't say God directed it. I would say God allowed it. And I think that when you um, look later on in church history and you look especially during the time of Constantine and after that, corrupt men were appointed to the role of, of bishop that, you know, as it changed to having, you know, one bishop over a city or a diocese and, and, and things like that. Eventually, corrupt men were appointed in those locations and they took over the institution of the church, but they weren't true Christians. A lot of these men were not true Christians. And eventually the church became more and more corrupt to the point where, you know, all of the, the bishops and, and, and popes were just corrupt men that just rejected the gospel, rejected the teachings of scripture and just corrupted uh, the church. But the one true church, you see, the church of Jesus Christ is not some structure. It's not some organization. It's an organic body of believers. Everybody who truly believes upon Christ and is truly saved is a part of the one true church, no matter what denomination they're from, whether they're from the Presbyterian church or whether they're from a Baptist church or a Brethren church or even a Pentecostal church. I would just say, look, Roman Catholics and Orthodox uh, people, if they don't, if they if they believe the teachings of the Orthodox Church, if they believe the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, then they're not true Christians. But if there's anybody there that does believe the gospel and just you know hasn't left yet or just doesn't quite understand what's wrong with the Roman Catholic Church, then that person is a part of the body of Christ. That they're a part of the one true church. You see, the church is not an organization. The church is an organic body of believers. It's, it's the body of Christ. Well, I hope you like this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up. 
hit the bell notification button. I'll see you in the comments section and you'll see me in my next video.